The speaker tonight is Ian Binney, Educational Coordinator for the Goodley Association. The theme of the talk tonight is the Scottish Soldier at Gallipoli. Good evening, everybody. Um, now, I must say straight away, uh, although being half Scottish, and uh, if um, uh, you weren't watching me on Zoom, uh, you could probably see a kilt, but of course the lower half isn't that important on Zoom. Um, but I'm not an expert on uh, the Scottish soldier at Gallipoli, but what I'm attempting to do tonight is to give an overview in about an hour of the Scottish involvement at Gallipoli. I know there are many of you here who know more about uh, more about individual units than I do and individual battles than I do. Um, so I'm what I'm giving is, an, is as I've said there, uh, an its brief introduction, uh, then uh, something about the Scots in the 29th Division. Uh, I'll speak a little bit about the Royal Naval Division, then the 52nd Lowland Division, moving on to the Scottish Horse, and then the Scottish VCs and Scottish Anzacs. And this will be different to previous talks because I'll also to be uh, talking about members' contributions. Uh, the whole idea of doing this talk, uh, I've enjoyed putting it together, uh, of course, uh, was also to engage with uh, the members uh, north of the border, the Gallipoli Association members north of the border, and I know there are uh, some here tonight, uh, and also uh, there's some from museums, regimental museums, or from um, regimental associations as well. If there's time, um, I'll talk about the terrible Quintershill railway disaster uh, as well. Uh, now, the picture on the right is the King's Own Scottish Borders in Gallipoli. Um, the internet isn't very good with pictures. Um, sometimes they're correct, sometimes they're not. So I do apologise in advance if I have any, uh, make any mistakes. Okay, so uh, before we actually move on to the, uh, the meat of the talk I just wanted to for us to reflect upon one soldier and this comes um, from the details from an excellent website there are many many websites the Sons of Galloway uh, website here and this is just one Scottish soldier uh, private uh, 1675 Robert Gilbert first fifth king's own Scottish borderers and I think I'll just give you a few seconds to read that I won't say any more uh, and we be, apart from saying that a lot of young Scottish men died in Gallipoli a lot served and we must remember all of those if possible okay and uh, moving on, my wife is a much better historian than myself. If any of you met her, that becomes patently obvious. And uh, uh, she always says you must have some big questions. So the big questions, um, which we can have a discussion at the end, and I'll try and answer these. I'll sum up my answers to these at the end. Was it a case of lions led by donkeys? Obviously, that phrase uh, uh, became uh, well known because of Alan Clark, although he lied about its origin. Um, not a very good historian. If any Alan Clark fans amongst you, I don't uh, apologise for saying that. But was it a question of lions led by donkeys? Was the role of the Scottish soldier significant? Did Gallipoli have a significant effect back in Scotland? And were lessons learned from failures at Gallipoli? Was it part, could we see the beginning of this learning curve that many historians talk about. Just a word about the slides. Sometimes there's not a huge amount of information on slides. Sometimes I'll add to it. Some of the slides about particular battles, I'll have to go through in a little bit more detail and read quite big chunks out um, because it can become a little complicated and I hate to make mistakes. And there's a photograph of the Royal Scots. I must say the internet is and books are actually quite sloppy about the difference between the Royal Scots and the Royal Scots Fusiliers. Um, so if anybody sees that, a photo that they think is wrongly named, you can let us know in the chat or at the end. So, of course, a proud Scottish 
military tradition. No doubt about the, uh, the uh, Scottish participation, the Scottish uh, support for United Kingdom wars. And if I was having a test, I would test you on those two battles, but of course, everybody would know those. So. Um, but of course, uh, there's other well-known Scotsmen and uh, the person, military Scotsman, and the person who led the campaign, uh, General Sir Ian Hamilton, born in Corfu, um, but his family home was in Linlithgow. And uh, he enlisted in his father's regiment, the Gordon Highlanders. Uh, that's why he was born in Corfu, because they were stationed there. And he took part. He had a good military career up until uh, Gallipoli. But of course, there are many of you who have views about him, Stephen Chambers in particular. Um, but he took part in uh, the unsuccessful expedition to rescue Gordon, Anglo-Afghan War, um, and both Boer Wars before um, going on to various staff posts and commanding uh, the uh, British, uh, Allied forces in Gallipoli. I haven't actually put in a summary of the Gallipoli campaign because many of you here are far more expert on Gallipoli than myself, and it's just a question of time as well. I'll be making a recommendation for further reading at the end if you want to find out more about the Gallipoli campaign, but I'm not actually going to give an overview or much detail about the campaign apart from how it affected Scottish soldiers. And also you had uh, probably one of the, uh, uh, the generals with the worst reputation in the First World War, um, Hunter Western, there he is at the front there. Uh, he came from one of the counties, uh, the country's oldest landing, landowning families, born at Hunterston in Scotland. And while he was at Gallipoli, he actually met some of his estate workers, whether he knew them or knew they were there um, uh, whilst in Gallipoli. But of course, we shouldn't forget that Hague, um, very controversial, getting a bit better treatment by historians over the last 25, 30 years, uh, was Scottish as well. No, no doubt the Scottish involvement in the leadership, British leadership and allied leadership uh, in uh, the First World War uh, was quite prominent. So uh, Scotland and the war, but approximately, this is the First World War, of course, approximately 10% of the British regular army over, uh, over, well, since it's been measured, that sort of statistic uh, was from Scotland. Um, the Highland regiments, of course, were world renowned, the kilt and ex the bagpipes, etc. Um, but was there a rivalry with the Lowland regiments? Um, some authors, and I'll quote one of them, talks about that at uh, length. Uh, but there's whatever, um, there's no doubt the commitment of both the Highland regiments and the Lowland regiments during the First World War, and of course, during Gallipoli itself. A strong tradition of volunteering um, with young men becoming both territorials and yeomanry, including in the Lowlands, you know, quite in the big cities, but also in the uh, uh, farming areas of the Lowlands, a great tradition of volunteering. And many of the people, many of the soldiers rather, who ended up at Gallipoli had volunteered for the territorials of the yeomanry before that. August 1914, um, uh, a huge response as there was in uh, the rest of the United Kingdom. Over 20,000 volunteers signed up at one recruiting centre alone in Gurukh. Scotland provided, um, according to Royal, I'll mention his book at the end, over 320,000 volunteers, but not including the territorials and yeomanry. Um, and by the end of the war, over 688,000 Scots served in the armed forces. And most of those, of course, sorry about the typo, there'll be one or two of those, saw service on the Western Front. One regiment, the Royal Scots, um, uh, consisted of 10 battalions. The eve of the World War I had 10 battalions of 
uh, regulars, seven others were territorial bat battalions. In the end, like many of the famous regiments in the United Kingdom, uh, th uh, similar numbers, for example, in the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, who I have a kind of minor connection with, uh, raised similar number of battalions, 35 battalions of infantry, of which 15 were active frontline units. Of, of the 100,000 men who served in the Royal Scots, uh, you see the figures there for killed and wounded. And these active service battalions, the 15 active service battalions, served all over the world and they awarded a total of 71 battle honours. We could have a test if any Royal Scots experts here um, on what those battle honours were and of course uh, six uh, Victoria Crosses. So here we are in Gallipoli um, and I'll mention and many of you know a lot about the Gallipoli campaign. There are the three fronts. I won't be mentioning much about the um, about the Anzac front here, but there's Suvla, Suvla Bay and the Suvla front and uh, Hellas down here. Um, and I'll certainly uh, be mentioning that. So the first Scots in Gallipoli arrived with the, uh, the 29th uh, division and the 29th division uh, a lot of people including myself are interested in the 29th division called the Incom incomparable division sometimes uh, uh, nicknamed or rather uh, compared to the old napoleon's old guard because they were firefighting in so many different places um, the um, these were regular um, battalions uh, which were brought back to the United Kingdom when war broke out and um, actually billeted with civilians in uh, Warwickshire and um, uh, it was uh, said there the only division to take part in both the first day of the Gallipoli of Gallipoli the landings of course and at the Somme campaign in the Somme campaign the first day sorry getting a bit mixed up the first day of the battle of the Somme incurred over 94,000 casualties 27 VCs the highest for any British division and you see them arriving from abroad in the murky weather in uh, Leamington that is and uh, that is the King's Own Scottish Borders, who came from Lucknow. They were the band of the King's Own Scottish Borders, the first uh, King's Own Scottish Borders, who was stationed in India. When I said on that previous slide um, that some had seen action already, the South Wales Borders um, saw action against the Germans in China at Sing Tao. So the Scottish presence, um, I say they're all billeted in Warwickshire. Um, and uh, the good people of Warwickshire had to be used, very used to uh, Welsh, uh, Irish and Scottish accents, but you had the 87th Brigade included the first King's Own Scottish Borderers, and a number of territorial battalions were added later in the war, but there was only one, I believe, uh, at Gallipoli. Uh, if I make any errors, please correct me at the end. And that, that was the 1st, 5th Royal Scots in the 88th Brigade. So there was a Scottish presence, one battalion in the 87th Brigade, one battalion in the 88th Brigade. Um, and uh, they made a lasting impression. And that's one of my favourite photos, courtesy of Coventry Archives. And uh, uh, there of the two children looking at some uh, men of the uh, 29th Division doing the washing. And of course, there's a monument to them in uh, the uh, monument to the division in Stretton-upon-Dunsmore in, in Warwickshire. And OK, so the uncomparables, the uh, battalions from the 86 and 87 Brigade landed at Five Beaches under the command of uh, Major General Hunter Weston. If you ever want to see a, um, a, a demotivating speech, look at his speech to the troops before they landed. Um, very strange affair. Uh, I think it's in Peter Hart's book on Gallipoli. Uh, three of the landings faced little opposition, um, but a familiar story with Gallipoli, um, the, uh, the um, position of the, being there almost by surprise was not exploited. And on Y Beach, uh, uh, the first uh, serious, uh, the first um, 
casualty rather of a high ranking officer, Lieutenant Colonel Archibald Coe of the first K uh, KOSB was killed. And eventually the battalion was taken off, but there's not time to, to talk about that tonight. Uh, the objectives of the first day of the campaign, the village of Krithia and the hill of Achibaba. This is in Hellas, that map I showed you. If you remember the map, the blue line um, never got as far, the trench line as Krithia and the hill of Achibaba. First attempt to capture these, 28th of April, the first battle of Krithia. Uh, there were some gains, but heavy casualties. When I've got both, uh, that's the, the first fifth Royal Scots and the first K, um, uh, KOSB were involved in those battles. Attack resumed on the 6th of May, 2nd Battle of Krithia, 88th Brigade attacked along something called Fig Tree Spur. I'll show you a map a little bit later on. After two days of fighting, no real progress, and the 1st, 5th Royal Scots were involved in that. In May, Hunter Weston uh, was replaced by uh, Delisle, who did uh, appreciably better than him. Um, then on the 4th of June, you had the 3rd Battle of Crisia, 1st, 5th Royal Scots uh, were involved in that. And then some success, the division um, at the Battle of Gully Ravine on the 28th of June, 86 brigades seized Gully Spur, but there weren't the two Scottish regiments there. 6th of August, a diversion to prevent the Turks moving troops to Suvla. In the Battle of Crithia Vineyard, 88th Brigade, another costly and futile attack along Crithia Spur, and that was uh, the first, fifth Royal Scots involved in that. They were transferred, as said, they were like the fire brigade um, at Suvla. Um, they were involved in the Battle of Scimitar Hill on 21st of August. Um, uh, uh, an offensive has caused very, very heavy casualties and achieved very little. Um, the 87th Brigade, including some of the 1st KSB, managed to get to the top of Scimitar Hill, uh, but uh, were driven off. And then finally, after suffering very, very high casualties, the division was evacuated from Gallipoli on the 2nd of January 1916, moving to Egypt before being sent to France in March. So two battalions present there in the 29th Division, the incomparables who are so important in the story of Gallipoli, but no more important uh, than other divisions, of course. And uh, I said there, um, the first KOSB landed at Y Beach. They could see Krithia in the distance. Perhaps they could have taken Krithia. Lieutenant Colonel Archibald Coe was killed. Uh, <clears throat> The battalion took part in the first ever evacuation at Gallipoli. Excuse me, just take a drink. It's not alcohol, I'm, I assure you. Um, that is from Y Beach, um, shortly after the landing. And uh, the casualty cal calculations, I'm including this, come out at 100% for every two months of the eight months there in Gallipoli. That's the first KOSB. Uh, the memory, keeping the memory alive of, of battalions like this, very important in Scotland, important all over uh, the United Kingdom, Ireland and um, uh, Australia, New Zealand and Newfoundland and India, um, but um, uh, in Scotland particularly, as we'll see. Uh, the Royal Naval Division, <clears throat> there's some uh, perhaps... Um, describe it as rumours that some of the battalions of the Royal Naval Division were Scottish, uh, but there were um, a number of um, reservists from Scotland because um, the reservists, when they uh, reported, were told in many cases <coughs> they were going to uh, join the Royal Naval Division rather than go on ship. And um, uh, the four battalions were particularly interested, the 2nd Brigade, Collingwood, Anson, Hood and how um, they included a lot of um, reservists from Scotland, particularly from the Clyde. But I don't believe anybody can correct me at the end if if they like. Whoops, sorry. Um, I don't believe that um, any of the battalions was predominantly Scottish. Peter Hart has helped me with providing some of the casualty figures, and they do seem to uh, include. In each battalion, a lot of Tyne ciders, Weir ciders, etc. They weren't ready to go to Flanders, so um, this is the second brigade because the first brigade fought at Antwerp. Um, they 
um, 300 helped the landings at V and W Beach and the rest disembarked the day after. Brigade took part in the battles of Krithia, suffering very heavy casualties. And uh, spot the Scotsman there, there's a, um, the Royal Naval Division in the uh, battle of one of the battles of Krithia, uh, worked closely with the French forces and there they are presenting a captured Turkish machine gun uh, to the French and there's the man, is it the Glengarry Bonnet, um, who uh, is undoubtedly Scottish there. <clears throat> so we come on to a very, very interesting division and I know many of you here have got a lot of interest in it, the 57, 52nd Lowland Division, uh, formed entirely from territorial battalions, mainly from the lowlands, contained because they were territorial battalions and they volunteered, of course, in their part time, uh, they were from very similar backgrounds. So uh, the first, fourth Royal Scots were from Glasgow middle class, first, seventh um, Royal Scots, Glasgow dock workers. Um, and first, fifth, for example, these are just examples, KOSB were agricultural workers. Um, so um, they were almost, even though they were territorials, almost like um, uh, PALS battalions. Many territorials ended up volunteering, though, and they were replaced by volunteers. And a number of the officers of these um, and NCOs of these territorial battalions complained that people that, um, soldiers that came uh, in August 1914 weren't the ones they expected. Uh, they were volunteers rather than the other territorials. And some of those territorials had volunteered, if, it's, if you can follow this, uh, ended up volunteering uh, for other regiments, in some cases, Highland regiments, as I said there. The reputation of Highland regiments uh, meant that they actually did quite well with recruits. English regiments sent recruiters into the lowlands as well, and some of the, some of the territorials um, who had been in the territorials uh, since 1908 in the formation, they joined English regiments. But despite everything, they still had a, a strong local feel. Uh, <clears throat> they were obviously willing volunteers. Uh, now, I'll mention a PhD thesis, I've read brilliant PhD thesis about the 52nd Lowland Division, and incredible confusion, partly because um, the established military order didn't, some weren't keen on territorials, despite their fantastic service uh, during the war. So many battalions were actually hastily formed dissolved and reformed for all quite why we just don't know um, and I tried to follow it in this thesis but it's actually quite hard to to pin down training I didn't know this was interrupted by different duties um, as they were meant for home defense instead of training once they brought together um, they were used whoops sorry uh, they were used for home defense and this confusion of the role so rather than training for overseas service because most of them were going overseas uh, they were guarding the coastline the training actually quite poor route marches uh, uh, supplemented by a few lectures and i said i've repeated myself sorry about this even this limited training interrupted by different duties they were told they'd be available for overseas service on the 5th of April. 82 days later, many of them were dead. Now, for me, it's rather like as a teacher, um, and I'll just uh, spend a few seconds saying this, an ex-head teacher, it's rather like being told at the end of the spring term that you're going to overseas service. By the end of the summer term, your battalion has been virtually destroyed. Now that's not a long time to prepare. The division was told, like many divisions, it did not need its artillery, as there was plenty in Gallipoli anyway um, already. When they got to Gallipoli, a little bit of training, some of the officers, some of the NCOs went into the 29th Division trenches or the RND trenches, um, but not a great deal of time for training. And then the brigades. Um, the one there in red was involved in the Quintershill uh, railway disaster, very, very sadly. Um, so you had the South Scottish Brigade, the Fusiliers and the KOSB, um, the 156 Brigade, uh, the 
Scottish Rifle Brigade, the Cameronians, the Royal Scots, um, the 57th Highland Light Infantry Brigade, uh, mainly uh, mainly the Highland Light Infantry, but also some Argyll and Southern and Highlanders. About 17,000 men altogether, um, including support services. Less than two months, it suffered 4,461 casualties. Um, you see what I, am my uh, allusion to school terms. It's not a long time from their decision to send them abroad till they'd been really hammered casualty-wise. And uh, there's a picture, the officers of the 1st, 5th Highland Light Infantry. One feature, and I'm sure Stephen Chambers will agree, one feature of Gallipoli is that horrendous casualties amongst officers and NCOs. So I wonder how many of those um, uh, as territorial officers um, survived uh, the war, but particularly survived Gallipoli. So the, uh, spend a little bit of time on the Battle of Gully Ravine, and many of you uh, will have uh, an expertise, a greater expertise than I have, um, uh, 28th of June to the 5th of July. Single greatest loss of men, for example, it's just one example of any one day during the entire war uh, for the Cameronians. Uh, two, uh, two division, division uh, attacked on, 29th division, sorry, attacked on the left, their objective with two trenches, the 156th Brigade on the right, sorry, the objective with two trenches, H12 and H12A. Uh, 28th, 29th division, sorry, I'm getting, uh, I'll slow down a bit, 29th Division were given priority of artillery, relatively successful, pushing the Turkish trenches back a mile along the coast. Now, remember that. So, but they were given the priority of artillery. Um, but um, the Royal Scots and the Cameronians in the brigade suffered very heavy casualties, particularly the latter as the Turks chose to bombard their trenches as they were assembling. Um, the 4th Royal Scots CO Lieutenant Colonel Spotters was wounded and died the next day. The brigade received some help from the 29th Division, including the 1st, 5th Royal Scots. And I wonder if any of them knew each other and met old friends in those trenches. Um, there was a truce to bring in the wounded on 7th of July. The Turks suffered 16,000 casualties, the British 3,800. Was it a victory? Uh, was it a good example of attrition? The 29th Division had pushed the Turks back. Unfortunately, uh, the 156th Brigade had been suffered very, very heavy casualties. And I go back to this point, um, the 29th Division was given uh, priority for artillery. Um, there was a, many of you will have um, uh, seen this uh, or come across this book, Bl Bloody Red Tags, uh, which um, uh, scotches this myth that generals, British generals, stayed in chateaus and supped wine while the soldiers and the Western Front struggled through mud and blood. Um, it was similar on Gallipoli, uh, that many uh, senior officers became casualties. And this is uh, Brigadier General William Scott Moncrief. He was born in Chelsea, so a Londoner rather than a Scot, served in the Zulu War, wounded at Spinecart, worked with walked with a permanent lip, limp, sorry, uh, recalled as many officers, senior officers were in 1914 from retirement. And at Gully Ravine, he was told by DeLille that um, uh, that an uncaptured part of the gully had to be seized, had to be seized. Um, he was either killed by a sniper whilst watching the attack or attempting to go over the top with the two reserve companies. And that's, you know, it's a great story, isn't it? Um, that he was, he decided to go over the top with his men because he knew they'd suffer heavy casualties, just rather like the officer in that uh, rather anti-English film, uh, Gallipoli, and he's buried in Twelve Tree Culps Cemetery. And uh, there we have um, the uh, a map of the area. Um, just I'm just going to no. There we are. Okay, that's no, right. Stop that. Okay. Uh, there's Fir Tree Spur. We've spoken about Gully Spur, Gully Ravine. There's Crithia and Achibaba, remember that was one of the objectives on 
the first day. Uh, okay. So then there was the turn of the 155th and 157th Brigades in the Battle of Achi Baba Nulli. Just come back there. There's Achi Baba Nulli. Um, 12th of July, they decided to do it in two phases. 12th of July was chosen to enable the French artillery uh, who were on their right to prepare. Objective was to bring 1,800 metres of trenches in line with those at Gully Ravine. Remember the 29th Division had pushed forward, forward their trenches. This was an attempt to bring the trenches on the right in line. Uh, three lines of trenches have been identified, E10, 11 and E12. And... Uh, dividing the attack into two phases allowed the, the artillery to support each attack. And uh, with the 105th Brigade going over the top at 7.30 a.m., 157th Brigade attack at 4.50 uh, four, yeah, 4 p.m. The much depleted 156th Brigade was in reserve. Um, now, there's confusion about the third trench because the third trench uh, was... Um, barely in existence and Hunter Weston found out about this and sent orders that E12 should only be attacked when E11 was consolidated. Remember it goes E10, E11, E12 uh, and I've called this a, a trench too far because an aerial photograph shows that E12 hardly existed. Hunter Weston sent troops only be attacked when E11 was seized but it never reached those attacking troops Artillery bombardment much more effective. Early morning, 155th Brigade captured E10 and E11, but then they went out in search of the third line, E12, and couldn't find it. And they went further and further and further. Um, 157th found the same in the afternoon. First two lines were held despite heavy Turkish counterattacks. Uh, the trenches were packed with dead. And, uh, it, groups from the 1st, 7th Highland Light Infantry began to retire from the front line, um, taking a number of men from the uh, from the 1st, 5th Argyle and Southern Highlanders, but they were rallied and the gap was plugged. Egerton, I'll come back to Egerton, who he was. He was the commanding uh, the uh, brigadier. Um, uh, the divisional commander, rather, a very critical thought the attack was not needed. Uh, amazingly, a private James Cohen brought in over 50 wounded. Um, he was then killed on the 4th of December and rightly awarded a posthumous DCM I mentioned in this passage, but bringing in under fire, 50 wounded, incredible. And there's a picture uh, drawn of the time, and there's the uh, E12, the trench up there, E10, 11, and there's E12, uh, which was a, uh, is described as a dummy. And that's when many, many soldiers, Scottish soldiers, were killed trying to get to that uh, non existent trench. And uh, Hunter Weston, uh, I, I mentioned his, um, his uh, pretty poor speech to the troops. Um, but he actually used this phrase, oh, the pups have been blooded. He was delighted the pups had been blooded. Terrible thing to say. And uh, you see, did he mean this sort of thing? Um, this is from an account written by a survivor. Uh, two officers of the first, fourth, King's Own Scottish borderers. Come away, borderers, don't be beaten, was the stirring cry of Captain A. Wallace as he continued to advance, although badly wounded and with blood streaming down his face, until he was hit again, this time to fall a dying man. Lieutenant J.B. Innes had one of his arms shattered by a bursting shell. He got his cousin, Lieutenant W.K. Innes, to cut it off asked for a cigarette and continued to cheer the borders on until he died from loss of blood. Sorry. Um, so just pausing for a moment, incredible bravery and incredible fortitude. And it's rather disappointing that Hunter Weston describes them as pups and uh, being blooded. Um, anyway, Egerton, very long winded name there. Uh, Major General Granville George Algeron Egerton. He was command of the 52nd Division. Uh, he was born in London, commissioned into the Seaforth Highlanders, served in Afghanistan, where he was severely wounded, uh, mentioned in dispatches. No doubt the bravery of these, um, just in uh, with the um, 
the bravery of Hunter Weston and, um, and the others, uh, no doubt of the bravery at all. And he was mentioned in dispatches fighting in the Anglo-Egyptian War and the Sudan campaign. Became Scottish District Inspector of Musketry, so no fool, no Colonel Blimp. Um, became commander of the 1st Infantry Brigade in September 1909. He kept two very detailed diaries and he's very critical of many aspects of the campaign, uh, as well as uh, of Hamilton and Hunter Weston, critical of them. Undoubtedly cared for his men, regarded as nervous and excitable by others. And Hamilton and his staff felt he was losing grip on discipline and morale. One thing they, uh, a staff officer pointed out was the very untidy, dilapidated trenches. But I think it's fair to say he was one of the many officers who just felt very brave, a lot of experience in colonial warfare, failed to adjust to the demands in uh, high-tech trench warfare. His diary also detail, uh, details his poor health. He actually gave evidence to the Dardanelles Commission. Hamilton would have delighted to uh, shut him up, um, but he was very critical. And there's, uh, they are available, available, um, the Egerton diaries and papers. Um, and he talks about the terrible casualties. I like the, the middle one. Oh my God, what a life this is. I should want a six month rest cure if I survive. And please God, no more soldiering for me. Um, but many of his soldiers, uh, not his fault, but many of his soldiers uh, didn't get uh, anything like a rest cure after. And he said, as an old regular officer and commander of a territorial division in the field, I should always hold that the men who were territorial soldiers on August the 4th, 1914, were, of all those who battled during the four years of conflict, the real true salt of the earth. Few of them remain, and very meagre with the thanks they got. And I think that's, uh, whatever his fault, is a fitting tribute to the 52nd Division. But he was replaced by um, Sir Herbert Alexander Lawrence. I'd never actually heard of him, so I've included quite a, a few details. Uh, another Londoner um, served in the Boer War, uh, resigned his commission because he passed over as commanding officer of the 17th Lancers in favour of Haig. Made a successful banking and business career. Um, he then became, he was recalled and had various um, command posts he, uh, in the Gallipoli campaign. Successfully oversaw the withdrawal at Cape Helles. He returned to Egypt, uh, but then he was... Um, asked to be relieved of his command uh, because he thought the invasion of Palestine was very unwise. Um, he then uh, was out of favour for a while in home service and then he became, he returned the command of a fighting unit um, and uh, was to see action on the Western Front. And then, interesting, this is what I didn't know, he replaced Charteris as Chief Intelligence Officer and became Chief of the General Staff. So a connection there between the 52nd Lowland Division and the highest, one of the highest ranking officers in the military. And he insisted on tidy trenches. He was energetic and popular, held regular conferences, seeking the views of junior officers. Morale improved significantly. He introduced weekly classes for officers and used the relatively inactivity as things quietened down. When I say quietened down, an awful lot of casualties to introduce a rigorous training regime. And the division became more proficient at sniping, bombing and trench mortars. And they had some successful minor tactical victories in November and December. Uh, but uh, the division, 52nd Lowland Division, took incredibly heavy casualties, went on to fight in uh, the Western Front, and um, uh, Marshal Patan, no less, described them as a division d'elite, uh, which he noted on every occasion, uh, gave on every occasion a proof of an irresistible dash in spite of hardships and great losses. So had they gone through a learning curve? Um, it looks like it, doesn't it, if we accept the, uh, that term. During the time, at, towards the end, uh, later on, uh, the 52nd, um, there was a mutiny of the first six Highland Light Infantry. And I just wanted to mention that there was a night attack planned by the 157th Brigade on the 15th, 16th of August. Egerton had gone. Um, 
the men lay down in no man's land so they're beginning to learn different be use different tactics really to rush the turkish trench at night so was this new so yeah uh, question mark missing there punctuation not a strong point of mind was this an example of a learning curve um, some of the the men refused to get up and the attack petered out so it seemed that there'd been a mutiny of this first six high and light infantry but the uh, the resulting investigation said there were enormous difficulties and no written orders um, there were difficulties obviously commanding communicating in the dark particularly verbally lack of experience ncos and bizarrely and officers bizarrely a great shortage of watches so they couldn't actually uh, in the dark uh, work out when they were supposed to attack and um, i think it's very important there were no uh, punishment as a result of uh, no direct order had been refused um, and of course the troops hadn't recovered from the battering they uh, received uh, in July and they were exhausted from trench digging in the days before. 19th of August Hamilton said that the Lowland Division had not a good spirit in it but of course as we've seen the new uh, commanding officer really dealt got that spirit back. I shouldn't forget first garrison battalion Royal Scots a uh, Labour battalion um, they were both at Lemnos and Hellas. Um, they then went to Egypt and Cyprus, and some were still there uh, in May 1919. And they one of the few garrison battalions uh, that earned them a king's colour. Very, very rare. Now, the Scottish horse, um, the, um, uh, a very old um, uh, yeomanry uh, organisation, um, uh, formed by a uh, very famous uh, uh, man with a very famous Scottish name, Marquis of Tillibardine, Bardine. and of course you had um, the uh, first, second and third Scottish horse, uh, along with the mounted ambulance, uh, went to, um, interestingly, on the SS Transylvania, um, and they sailed to Gallipoli, landed on Suvla on the 2nd of September, um, joining the 2nd Mountain Division. The 2nd Mountain Division had been decimated at what I call the Balaclava of the Dardanelles, uh, the attack on um, Scimitar Hill. And then they uh, evacuated in December 1915, eventually absorbed into the 52nd Division, so Scots keeping Scots together. Uh, and there was another brigade, and uh, this is a, a genuine photo, I believe, uh, correct photo. There was a Highland Mounted Brigade made up of the first five, uh, first uh first first five and four for yemenry the first lovett scouts and the second lovett scouts obviously um the um and the son of that lovett went on to lead the uh the commandos at d-day oops sorry and uh, also included the highland mounted brigade uh field ambulance corps and they seem to be uh uh, I can't find out that much detail and perhaps somebody could point me to the right direction on the Scottish horse, um, but um, uh, in their, their actual service in Gallipoli, um, but they are remembered in Norfolk, they're based in Norfolk and that picture of a commemoration comes from I think 2016, uh, commemorating them in Norfolk, so they're well remembered in Norfolk, uh, the, um, the second brigade. And of course, um, the, Scot the, the mounted, Scottish Horse Mounted Brigade Field Ambulance, uh, those of you who don't know, had a, an operating car designed by Colonel Wade, included all the works, operating tables, sterilizers, etc. And that car was used in Suvla. And that, I believe, is a, a genuine picture of the car. And there's a memorial in Dunkel Cathedral. It's a, a lot of memorials in Scotland. I'll come back to that. Uh, absolutely right and proper there is. Um, there can never be enough as far as I'm concerned. And uh, that's one to uh, the Scottish horse. On to the Scottish VCs. David Ross Louder, uh, if that's the right way. First, fourth, RSF. Um, he won it, uh, awarded, sorry, the VC, 13th of August, 1915. Um, through, um, uh, 
Uh, he threw a bomb uh, which failed to clear the parapet. No time to smother the bomb and Private Loader put his foot on it, um, blowing his foot off, but the rest of his um, crew escaped unhurt. He died in 1972, was involved in a very serious um, tram accident in, Scot in Glasgow, but survived to tell the tale and actually uh, displays quite great bravery there. And then you had the other VC winner, George Mackenzie Sampson from Carnoustie, um, and in the Royal Naval Division, Royal Naval Reserve, rather. Um, and he was a part of the uh, group with Edward Unwin, the commander of the River Clyde, trying to get the lighters ashore in very, very heavy fire. Later achieved the rank of petty officer, joined the Merchant Navy after the war, died of pneumonia, sadly, in 1923 on active service, buried in Bermuda. And there he is, remembered in his um, hometown. Now, many of the Scottish, um, uh, many of uh, the Anzacs were of Scottish origin, and this I'll come back to this in the moment, uh, a little bit later on. Uh, this is uh, from one of our members who sent the information in, I believe they're present tonight, and Mr Dowie, uh, that uh, Diaz Lumsden, and like many of the Anzacs, this is not to diminish the importance of um, uh, uh, Gallipoli to the Anzacs at all, um, but many were uh, of Irish origin, of Scottish origin, of English origin, and so on. And one was this uh, young man here, and they emigrated to Australia and uh, volunteered um, to fight in the Australian um, infantry force, the AIF and uh, he sustained a bullet wound to the chest on 30th of April 1915 and uh, he rejoined his unit on the 16th of June uh, but he died, he served on Western Front and died on the 30th of July, sorry. Um, and he was buried at Netley Military Cemetery but his father's request, his body was removed and buried at Linlithgow Cemetery. Linlithgow of course is where the Hamilton family live. Oh, sorry, done the wrong way. And uh, but there was a whole unit of Scottish As Australians. Uh, a volunteer militia battalion was formed. The Victorian Scottish Regiment became in before the war the 52nd Australian Infantry Battalion, and many of them volunteered en masse for the 5th Battalion AIF, and they continued to wear the distinctive Glengarry cap. And uh, they took part in the landing at Anzac Cove on the 25th of April. I said I wouldn't mention Anzac very much, but uh, I forgot about this lot. Um, and then they were moved uh, um, to, uh, to Hellas, rather than from Hellas, to Hellas to attack in the battle on Crithia. They took part in the battle of uh, Lone Pine and then uh, continued to serve at Gallipoli. And I'm told this is a very a genuine picture of this 1st Battalion at McLaren's Hill. Now, coming to the human cost, you know, thousands of young Scotsmen lost their lives. And this was this is an airship newspaper showing those that were killed in Gallipoli uh, from air. Uh, and uh, uh, those sort of newspaper accounts would have had a, a huge impact back in uh, Scotland. Um, and commemoration, of course, uh, the, uh, the uh, many, as I said, many monuments to uh, uh, the Scottish uh, war dead, those who served and died in Gallipoli. And you might be able to name, if we had a quiz, name that relatively unknown uh, Scottish politician in 2015, putting rightly, putting a wreath there on the Scottish War Memorial and the 100th anniversary of uh, Gallipoli. Um, but it's not just a centenary. This is just an excerpt from little, uh, uh, from a news, a little excerpt from the newspaper um, that. Um, the in Inverclyde, this is I think new from 2018. Um, they were having a regular, um, a regular commemoration, if that's the right word, July the 12th uh, every year uh, on the. Uh, around 300 Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders from the town. And that's what I mean. And despite what I said earlier about the, uh, the movement of, uh, of territorials to volunteers and volunteers into the territorials, still you had uh, very 
big clusters in one or two uh, particular areas. And this is um, 105th anniversary of the battle. Uh, Deputy Provost Ronnie Alfred, Councillor Lynn Quinn and Mr Hunter. And there's a picture of them there. Uh, so many people rightly keeping the memory of the Scottish involvement in Gallipoli alive. And young people as well. Uh, this is remembering the first seventh Royal Scots. Uh, this is the Kilmeny Youth Centre. And there's a number of these pictures on our own website, but it's great. And we'd all think fantastic, isn't it? Youngsters involving, involved in this sort of memorial, mainly, of course, in this case, uh, to the Quintessil Railway disaster. Um, so members' contributions. So what I did was to... Uh, to email all the Scottish members and got lots of lovely responses. Um, uh, I have a relative killed at Gallipoli, 12th of July 1915. Um, he's, he was my father's eldest brother and his person I was named after. The name was Gilbert Elliot Michael. That's from uh, a Gilbert Michael member, current member of the Gallipoli Association, served in the Royal Scots Fusiliers. An interesting one. I'm afraid I'm a Northern Irishman. Nothing wrong with that. Living in Scotland, uh, my link to the Gallipoli campaign is through my research of a relative that was killed in action, 5th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles at the Pimple. That's from uh, Bobby Friel. Alan Dowell had lots of interesting conversations. Um, my Scottish connection with Gallipoli is my grandfather was with the Howe Battalion Royal Naval Division, originally from Dundee and one unfortunately I've lost the name of the person who sent me this my, if he's here tonight she's here tonight do tell me um, my grandfather Francis Michael Stephen was with the first seven Scottish Rifles transferred to the Royal, Royal Engineers finished up in the Royal Marine Labour Corps reached Gallipoli 21st and 9 15 and there's um, William Hill um, there's also now I believe as Dowie a member of the Royal naval division and there's a lots of fantastic websites this is the dykes perth academy memorial website this was sent to me from somebody um, who has uh, helped put this together um, who was part of the u3a project that i'm running um, so really uh, the memories kept alive through ceremonies through books but also of, of course uh, through websites um, the only town memorial in Gallipoli, Stephen could tell me this is correct, this is from a member, Derek Robinson, uh, 700 men, the 1st, 4th KSB, would charge the field on the 12th, 12th of July 1915, only 17 remained to answer their names, staggering casualties. Over 300 men were killed, missing were captured, a further 300 were wounded. Only over 70 of these men had belonged to Hoik, if that's how you pronounce it. And that is actually there in the uh, memorial uh, in Gallipoli. Um, some of our members, Vince Gillen is, a, um, is a, an author, um, uh, our authors rather, um, he's written a book about about the 5th Battalion, Argyll and Southern Highlanders. I didn't think I could buy that or any others because my wife would have almost certainly divorced me had uh, any more books arrived through the post prior to this talk. But uh, there's a lot of volumes about individual regiments. Um, now, a very interesting one, spend a little bit of time. We're not far from the end of the talk now. Uh, uh, an Italian with a Scottish horse, and this was from Rosanna Allison. Great uncle Joseph Vargi served in the Scottish horse, killed in Gallipoli 1915. Um, she doesn't know as I find it, I've not been able to find out much about um, the, the actual service in Gallipoli of the Scottish horse. And I'll come to the photograph, the motorbike photo in the moment. Uh, interesting, my granny was a Letha and knew many of the boys killed in the Gretna disaster, the Quintessil railway disaster. We lived beside Rosebank Cemetery where the memorial is. A granny said a wee prayer every time she went past. And she was also fortunate to attend the centenary commemoration in London. School pupils from Leith Academy, and this, I think the Gallipoli Association was involved in this, um, where the Royal Scots soldiers lived, made glass dog tags and stenciled a poppy outside their homes. Really nice touch there. Um, and there's a picture of Joseph Aki, the seated, he's the one seated in the picture below on the motorcycle, possibly in Northumberland, who went to Gallipoli in September. 
and there's an amazing uh, postcard from Joseph to his mother in Edinburgh, sent from Blankton Hall in Northumberland, where the Scottish horse was stationed, and a letter home, possibly from a senior officer from CO, showing the wooden cross uh, that was there. Um, what a beautiful and a poignant uh, uh, piece of historical evidence there, uh, produced, uh, pr provided very kindly by one of our members. And he was possibly a, members, a messenger or attached to the field ambulance unit. He was killed on the 7th of October 1915, buried in Lalababa Cemetery on the Gallipoli Peninsula. And Norman Dowie, four Scottish relatives at Gallipoli. So I think that could possibly be a record uh, if Norman is here, four Scottish rel relatives. Uh, his grandfather, Douglas Durk, who was in the Scottish horse and landed at Suvla with his regiment, the Scottish horse were at Hetman Chair. On his mother's side, a great uncle, George Reed Lawrence, um, and who emigrated to Australia, 9th Battalion, Australian Infantry, very first wave of landing. And then those two great uncles, the one I posted the picture up a little bit earlier there. Um, so um, it, very, very interesting from Norman Dowie. And if he's present, thank you very much for that. And do speak up if I've got anything wrong. So finally, finally, uh, the Quintessential disaster. Uh, I think we always do need to mention this. Uh, I'll slow down a little uh, to talk about this. Took place the 22nd of May 1915 near Gretna. Three trains crashed near the signal box just after 6.30 a.m. 220 people killed, 246 injured. 214 were from the 1st, 7th Royal Scot. Carriages and one train burst into flames and terrible testimony from survivors about soldiers dying, being, bore, uh, being burnt to death. Uh, the Caledonian Railway Company, it wasn't, of course, nationalised until later. Uh, it's a private company. And um, I'll come back to that in a moment. Two signalmen, George Meakin and James Tenley, were arrested, found guilty of negligence, charged with manslaughter and imprisoned. They were released after serving just over a year of their sentence, re-employed by the Caledonian Railway Company, but not a signalman. And they were using the CRC, not I'm not looking at conspiracy theories or blaming them too much. They were using outdated wooden carriages with gas cylinder heating, and that's why they burst into flames. But, of course, the CRC and other railway companies were under pressure to get as much rolling stock on the train on the lines as possible. They did tolerate sloppy practice. Um, I think it was one of them, George Meakin, was late, and they were actually filling in a book when the uh, disaster occurred, filling in a book uh, saying that they were there on time. Uh, they, uh, the CRC put up with this sort of sloppy behaviour because of the shortage of skilled workers. Many railwaymen had volunteered to serve overseas. Um, George Meakin was on the night shift. James Tinley replaced him on the day shift. Both the experienced signal and good records. Supposed to change over at six o'clock, but they usually changed over at 6.30. Tinsley got a lift on the local train from the station nearest his house. It stopped on the line within sight of the signal box. The local train should then have been put on one of the loops, but he was taken up by a coal train and a goods train. The driver of the two trains that were stopped were in the signal box against the rules chatting, talking about the, um, the war, no doubt. Train movements are supposed to be recorded exactly in the book as they happen. Meekin and Tinsley were filling it in when the crash happened. They did not send the correct signal that the local train was blocking the main line. That was the main fault. And I said, uh, I've mentioned that already, the CRC were using outdate, outdated wooden carriages. And there we have, um, there's the Quintessil near Gretna signal box there. Uh, there's the coal train filling up one loop. There's the goods train filling up another loop. There's the local train at Mill Meakin and uh, Tinley had come in. And there's the troop train, which very sadly hit it. They, sh they should have put out warnings uh, that there was a stationary train on the line. One express had come past already. Um, this express 
coming past did even more damage because it hit the wreckage and some of the survivors from the troop train and uh, the local train i believe was empty and there's some horrific pictures the worst railway disaster occurring in this country and uh, a horrific picture there sometime after the carriage is still alight and there's some shock you can almost see the shock in their face uh, and it was originally planned to just send them straight off the survivors straight off but uh, uh, an officer did intervene a senior officer did intervene later on their journey he said look we've got to give these soldiers some time to get over this horrendous train crash that they're involved in and i just wonder how many of those survivors uh, were then became casualties in gallipoli and many memorials to it of course we mentioned one the allison family uh, but i believe that said edinburgh uh, station there do correct me if i'm wrong so what do we think was it a case of lions led by donkeys i think it when you look at people like hunter weston yes but moncrief who gave his life by being too far at the front and uh, edgerton who was deeply involved with his uh, the uh, what was going on with his uh, uh, battalions um, so i think the problem with with many of them as i've said before uh, they really were unsuited uh, for dealing with the complexities the new complexities of trench warfare and uh, i'll come back to this thesis very briefly i'm going to be talking now for a couple more minutes um, and uh, he said that many oops sorry uh, many of the soldiers many of the officers senior officers really uh, they became so bogged down that the only thing they could really do uh, was send troops over the top with a bayonet charge uh, they weren't really until the new breed of officers came along um, they weren't really trying out new tactics was the role of the scottish soldiers significant hugely significant the whole a division and a number of other battalions uh, paid many of them paid the ultimate sacrifice so undoubtedly undoubtedly very significant but the, unfortunately because of lack of resources lack of uh, artillery particularly um, and poor leadership at times there was um, uh, it was a defeat it was a defeat so just as the 29th division were the fire brigade the incomparables involved in the defeat the 52nd division and the other scottish soldiers uh, were um, involved significantly involved in something that was sadly a defeat did gallipoli have a significant effect back in scotland certainly i don't think it had any political effect um, and i've given a talk on the irish soldier in gallipoli and it's uh, the, the political effect um, some people link uh, the casualties in ireland to i think uh, uh, wrongly to the easter rising i don't believe it had a um a significant effect political effect there was turmoil um in uh, in strikes and the Clyde before uh, Gallipoli, but it did, the casualties uh, had a huge effect, particularly in those small areas which sent uh, small towns, which sent uh, numbers into Gallipoli, had numbers of their young men sent to Gallipoli, and the majority of them uh, uh, became casualties. And you can see that, I think, the uh, the significance of it by the number of memorials and the number of commemorations that still go on in uh, Scotland, rightfully so, and the Gallipoli Association really support that. Were lessons learnt from failures at Gallipoli? Yes, I do believe there were. And I think that's why the 52nd Division uh, received praise from Pitan, not as a very brave, dis uh, as a very brave a group of men but also tactically by that time very tactically astute and they learned the beginnings of that particularly with the change in command the 52nd division uh, change of command in gallipoli ironically interestingly there's the man the most people blame for uh, blame for gallipoli the most famous commander of the six first six royal scots fusiliers uh, 
And finally, historiography. Um, I've just included a few. Um, I say, as I've said there, um, I didn't use any unit histories or war diaries. Um, I think um, uh, I, this is an overview, weren't really needed, but this, uh, if you can get hold of it, it's quite easy to get hold of it. Just go on to the University of Salford. They sent it uh, an electronic copy the day after I asked for it. None of this nonsense of having to sign up for stuff. That's the 52nd Lowland Division of the Great War, Christopher S. Forrest. Very, very good. A good overview and uh, not much on Gallipoli and I don't think the section is that good on Gallipoli. I hope he's not joined us tonight. Trevor Royal, great military author, The Flowers of the Forest, very good. British regiments at Gallipoli, if you want to look at it in a forensic way, Ray Westlake, still available uh, on, uh, on Amazon, details all of the British regiments in Gallipoli and where they were. And you might have thought, well, if he's used that, how has he made so many mistakes tonight? A good overview of the battle, my favourite overview of the campaign, rather, uh, Peter Hart, Gallipoli. And then Stephen Chambers, he's here tonight, but really for me, and I'm not just saying this because he's a fellow trustee and a mate, um, the two books, if you really want to work out what a particular regiment, particular battalion was doing and what happened to them, and probably with the best sources available for that particular uh, battalion, these two books, Prithia, the new one, and Suvla, I go to all the time. They're my real go-to books if I'm doing a talk like this. Many excellent websites, as I said, ranging from regimental ones to those produced by volunteers as memorials and museum websites as well. Photographs, as I said, are quite rare. And if anybody can correct me on that and say, well, you can get loads of photographs by of the uh, Royal Scots or the KSB, correctly named um, to let me know. Okay, I think that is it. Well, thank you very much, Ian. That was wonderful. And I do love the way you actually asked yourself questions at the end. I saw how sneakily you got those in. Um, <laughs> very, very clever. Um, I think a few questions have come through. So whilst you're sort of getting your breath yes. back, um, a little bit of chit chat. I, was, you know, I found it quite interesting you mentioned, I think it was 10% of yeah. soldiers of the British Army were Scottish. Um, and I was unfairly going to ask what percentage of Scottish born and bred servicemen were in Scottish regiments, um, which is probably a little bit difficult to do unless you have got that information. But what I found interesting recently is um, I was talking to Margaret um, about a completely different post and looking at the 11th Australian um, um, Infantry um, uh, Battalion, um, who had 36, I think it was, soldiers killed mm. at a place called Lean's Trench. Now, out of the 36 soldiers in this Australian battalion, 20 were British, mm. um, yeah. um, Scottish, um, 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 uh, um, Irish, English, or Welsh at the time. So not necessarily saying that that percentage, which is whatever that works out to be 60 odd percent of the Australian army was from the UK. But at that time of the war, it wasn't unusual to have a, you know, a lot of Scottish soldiers who had enlisted yeah. not only English regiments, New Zealand regiments, yeah. Australian and Canadian, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think just a comment rather than an answer, there's a, a gentleman whose name escapes me, he's written the book, The Scottish Dispora, and he said that, so he estimates that 10,000 of the Australian infantry force, the first Australian infantry force, were Scottish. Now, I haven't been able to get hold of that book, so I haven't been able to, to analyse wow. that in any way. Um, so that's 10,000 over the whole of the war. Uh, so, um, but that's a pretty significant, uh, pretty significant figure. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I've um, got a few queries coming in. And again, if you'd like to ask Ian a question, either put it into the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. Um, got, got one came a little bit earlier on in the talk from Warren Smith. Um, he asked, you know, is it fair to say that Kitchener was fully aware of the shell shortage problem when he told Egerton not to take all his artillery to Gallipoli? Yeah. 
I think it was a very common thing, wasn't it? To show, well, not a common thing, but the shell shortage was in the Western Front as well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think it's strange, isn't it, that Kitchener would have said, or others would have said, uh, don't take, you don't need your artillery, there's plenty there. There wasn't. But I think that's perhaps more wrapped up in the, uh, the lack of, um, the lack of respect for the Turkish soldier. Um, they believe that, yes, the, um, the landings hadn't gone as well as they should do, but these new divisions would be enough to polish off the Turks. Uh, no, they, they didn't send, correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, they didn't send me any, any more regular divisions. They're basically territorial or, or um, service uh, divisions made up of service battalions. Um, so I think actually the fact that they sent those was because they underestimated the Turks. They thought that we'll get some more divisions in. We don't perhaps need as much artillery as uh, we need it on the Western Front. That should be enough. So I think that's how I would answer Warren's question. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some elements of that there. And of course, the 29th Division were the last regular division to be sent, and they were yeah. originally going to go to the Western Front, um, not Gallipoli. And of course, the Gallipoli campaign came about. Um, the only other thing I can add to that, Warren, is um, it's not so much the shell. Of course, I think Kitchener probably did know there's a shell shortage because he was sort of overseeing both what was happening on the Western Front as well as Gallipoli and you know, trying to rob Peter to pay Paul, I think, to, mm. a, circuit, to yeah. a certain extent. Yes. The other thing about Gallipoli as well um, is finding or having enough suitable positions for the artillery. So there may be some element in the truth that they didn't send yeah. as many guns because there weren't suitable places to put it. Because Hellas, um, you probably know, is quite a small battlefield. Anzac, because of its ridge lines, is extremely difficult to place guns. Um, Suvla, of course, sort of opens it up a little bit later on. So there could be an element um, of that there. And of course, the more guns you send, the more ammunition you need to send. So no use having guns without ammunition. Um, what else have we got here? Um, statement from Mark. I'm going back to the Quinton Shill. Um, yes. mentioned that Tinsley and Meakin um, actually made legal history by being charged with the same offence in Scotland and England, oh, right. as some of the yes. dead and wounded were, yeah, were yes. actually taken to Carlisle. So I don't know if you've heard yeah. about that. That's, that. That is quite fascinating. Yeah, I have heard that. Yes, yes. And those cases of uh, manslaughter, almost what we call corporate manslaughter, were pretty rare in those days as well. Uh, but there was such an outcry, of course, uh, that they had to punish. And were they scapegoats? No, the fact that they were, uh, they they broke so many rules. Um, one would lead them, uh, not lead them to think, lead one to think that they were being made scapegoats. Yes, the they had sloppy practice, but sloppy practice caused the. Um, of course, the uh, sloppy practice was tolerated by the CRC, as I've said, um, but it's sloppy practice that caused the uh, caused the crash, including not putting the warnings out that there was a stationary um, stationary train on the line. Yeah, yeah and that was so tragic for that battalion. And again, you know, those survivors, many of them got wounded or killed. A few, you know, you know, a few weeks later, yes, they did get out to Gallipoli. Yeah. Um, some good feedback here. Um, so us know how to go. So um, great talk. Thank you very much, Ian. Again, if you've got any comments for Ian, please put them into the chat. Um, um, or in a few minutes, um, feel free to ask them directly. I've uh, got a question from Alistair Cuthbert. Um, do you feel that the territorials were sacrificed on the right, no artillery, etc., in order to allow the 29th Division to achieve their objective on the 28th of June, 1915? It seems like it, doesn't it, really? Um, you know, why have one part of the attack with more support, more artillery support, and particularly as it's so uh, so rationed um, uh, than the other? And it's no surprise that the other uh, suffered a lot of casualties. Um, but of course, it, uh, having such a skewed front line didn't suit anybody, um, um, neither the Turks or the Allies. So that's why they went to try and straighten up the line. But Stephen, you've written about this. And um, you, uh, what do you feel? They are throwing it on to you. 
Very clever. Uh, yes, well, head teacher, head te ex head teacher <laughs> in action there. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't believe they were sacrificed. Um, um, you, you know, there's very little evidence of that. I think a lot of the because of the limit of gun and limit of shell for the artillery, and also when you look at the left, the western side um, of Gully Ravine, you've got five lines of trenches. On the right hand side, you've got two, two and a half lines of trenches. So on the left hand side, on paper, on trench map, it probably looked the tougher nut to crack, hence the whole weight or more weight of artillery on the left, as opposed to on the right. I mean, I would say it's probably more of that. I think they probably knew that it was going to be a tough nut to crack on the right as well as the left. Um, but unfortunately, um, you know, I think additional gunfire would have made a difference and it just wasn't available. So yeah, lots of needless casualties um, for that day. Uh, Vince um, Gillen, unfortunately the, um, the uh, Gor Gorok, I'm probably pronouncing that all wrong, the Gorok. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, the photo of you showed is an example of not believing everything you read in the press. The majority <laughs> of the Argyle casualties were from Greenock. Ah, right, the right. annual remembrance just happens to be held in Gorok, home right. of Darok, <laughs> their commanding <laughs> officer. <laughs> yeah, no, that's it's very important. This is only an overview, and um, uh, do um, uh, do correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, on that, uh, I really enjoyed putting this um, putting this talk together, and uh, but it was always going to be uh, always going to be an overview, uh, it, just with so many battalions, so many, and this is an excuse, so many battalions um, present, and particularly uh, Scottish territorial battalions. I thought of delving into into e each one would be impossible, and therefore you run the risk of favouring one against the other. Obviously yeah. the one that was involved in the Quintessil, um, Quintessil um, crash uh, needs to be mentioned, yeah. Can um, I make a comment about yeah, sure. a book written by an ex, well, a, a deceased member of the Gallipoli Association, Gavin Richardson, he died a couple of years ago. He produced a book in 1987 for King and Country and the Scottish Borderers, and it's predominantly. Oh, wow. Is that the little brown book? It's got a brown a cover. Little brown book. Yes. I know yeah. it very well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He yeah. also he did a second one after Gallipoli. Um, if you follow that, followed the um, battalion into um, Palestine. Um, but the the um, the first one about Gallipoli is excellent. It lists all the casualties from the um, the twelve seventh, um, twelve seven fifteen, um, and it's just you know page after page of all these. Yeah, guys, yeah, you know, yeah. Um, that was recommended to me. Uh, I don't know whether it's. Um, I think I uh, mentioned it. Yeah, to that's you. right. Yes, yeah. we had that. Thanks for that. Uh, yeah, but I did the look. The only up, problem is trying to get rid of it. <laughs> get, yeah. get hold of it now. Get hold of it. <laughs> it yeah. Wasn't it the one we looked at? So we looked at it on, on uh, Amazon. It was something like eighty pounds. Really? Pound. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. it's a very good book. It's a small book, but um, yeah. yeah, it's one I've yeah. used when I did my uh, Gully Review book. Um, yeah. 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 It doesn't. Yeah, it's not quite. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, ish. Yeah, if, you, if you can bring it further <laughs> back towards your face, then maybe that will focus. Uh, mm. No, you've disappeared now. <laughs> um, but yeah, if anyone's interested in that, um, just put something in the chat or contact us um, afterwards and we can give you the full title. But very good on the Cosbys. Um, yeah. And yep. uh, as Adam's saying, the other 12th of July attack. Um, another one he had there was... Um, Oh, I forgot who the author is now. You know, maybe he's here tonight. He's on the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, the first fifth battalion, mm. which is two mass. I think it's two massive volumes. Um, um, I, you know, I got a copy when it was launched. But if you know, if you want to know anything about the Argyles, um, 
um, or a sample Scottish battalion at Gallipoli, it is very, very good and has Thank photographs. <laughs> Oh, there you go, Vince. It's by Vince Gillen. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you're, it's, you're it's, very it's, I mean, yes. it's an absolute amazing piece of work. And yeah. um, um, it's, it's great at you know, stopping my table wobbling at home because it is so <laughs> thick. Yeah, great. <laughs> um, but, but an amazing work. I mean, is, that, is that still available? Yes, uh -huh. there's, yeah. there's an abridged version as well. Mm. Ah. Yeah, there you go. You're trying to force I, me I, to spend my money. Yes, I, I rarely know how to edit, you know, so that's why there's two volumes. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, definitely worth, um, yeah, um, sourcing, um, especially Thank if you, you have a, yes. um, you know, a relative in that battalion or just a general interest. So that's that, you know, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, other questions? Sorry. Sorry, yep. Yes. Could I make another wee comment if anybody's coming up to Scotland? that they can visit the um the Argyle and Southern Highlanders museum is reopened again in Stirling right. Castle. All ah, right. And then within what 15, 20 minutes drive, they can also travel to Doon, the small town of Doon, and they can see Hamilton's grave in the cemetery then. Mm. Mm. Oh. That is a really good tip, and that's yeah. something I need to do because um, I think during the centenary, the Group Association helped the local council sort of restore the grave. Right. Um, unfortunately, right. um, you know, I wasn't there. I think I was out in Gallipoli at the time, mm. um, but it's one place yeah I would like to go and visit. Yeah. Um, um, you know, and hopefully, I don't know, Alan, is, is the grave still in good condition? I haven't seen photos I've recently. Never. I've never seen it in recent times, but you're right. The council um, went in and uh, gave it a good tidy up. And I think that, I don't know if they replaced the stone or cleaned up the stone. Mm -hmm. um, the next time I'm, I'm in Dune, I'll go and have a look. Yeah, no, great. Because I think, yeah, I think, I think they cleaned it and um, mm -hmm. I think there was some, some, some sort of subsidence. So they managed to correct mm -hmm. that as well, which is fantastic. Um, and then just along the road, you can visit another distillery. So there you are. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. I'm up there tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Steve, I'm I'm very very happy to answer any questions. But um, can I just uh, share screen and show advertise a couple of events? Please um, do. And then I'll I'll be as long as uh, necessary. Um, let's have a look. Uh, where's my share screen? Um, The next talk is um, on the 26th of April. We don't have one in March because we now normally have a regional conference, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but this is called They Came, They Fought, They Did It, and this is about the French and mm. one particular uh, regiment of infantry, of the uh, um, Infantry Colonial of the Court Expeditionaire Dorian at Kumkali, 25th of April 1915, and a success story as well. And that's been given by uh, Tom, looking very dapper in his um, in his uh, suit and tie there. Tom Ardell, who's an overseas officer and a real expert on this area. Uh, and uh, you can get the link from me as normal using the same uh, Warwick Fuzz, um, uh, Warwick Fuzz uh, email address. And then if I can, uh, there we have, oops, screen share stopped as windows closed. Let's start again. And then, yep. And then we've got a commemoration of the 29th Division um, with Stephen will chuckle at this, the Lord Lieutenant of Warwickshire presiding um, on the 27th of February, this Sunday, 10.30, for anywhere near Leamington Spa. Leamington is a beautiful place, uh, really great, and uh, a marvellous church. And there's a, a commemoration service, 10.30, lasts about an hour and a quarter there uh, to the 29th Division. The reason we're holding it there is you take your life in your hands if you go to the, um, the monument in the A. 45. Uh, last time I went there, car, a car, nobody was in any danger, but a car just went straight over the roundabout at about 70 miles an hour. Uh, it's a death trap. Uh, and then we have um, 
the uh, third regional conference at Chelmsford, less than a fortnight now, there's still places, um, £25, uh, 25th of March this year, 9.30 to 5 o'clock in the fantastic Chelmsford City Museum, which is the home of the Essex Regiment collection. And um, uh, to get further details, you go on the website and to book a place. You can book a place even at this late stage, and it's going to be a really good conference. We've got um, some world-class historians speaking, including, of course, uh, our very own uh, Stephen Chambers. And Hester, um, what was um, been really important in organising this, helping, uh, assisting, well, it's not assisting me, it's a, a double act. Um, and she's asked me, if you have signed up for this, can you remember to send your lunch orders, please? Lunch orders. If I haven't got that right, Hester, come off mute and tell me what I should have said. You know what I'm like. Okay, so. Right. Okay, yeah. Um, could, could I just correct you on the conference? I think he said 25th of March. It's the 5th of March. Saturday. 5th of March. Yeah. 5th of March. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you. I always get something wrong. <laughs> so um, you can turn up on the 25th, but yes. maybe a little bit quiet. <laughs> yes. I was um, thinking of the 25 quid it costs, which is a yeah. bargain, yeah. which is a bargain for the world-class historians that we have there. Yeah. Well, what we've got yeah. some good ones. We've got Peter Hart, haven't we? We've, um, yeah, we've got... Um, talking on, I think, a poet. No, no, the Royal Name for Division. We've got Clive yeah. Harris talking on the Essex yeah. Regiment. Um, I'll be talking on Criffia and the Battles of Criffia. And um, Martin Purdy about me memorialisation, the Gallipoli Oak and so on. So, yeah. And I understand there should be some interesting, um, yep. what do you want to call them, sort of relics um, yeah. and museum displays yeah. on, yeah. which have they've organised especially for us. So, yeah, yeah, please come along if you're not doing yep. anything on yes. Sunday. Saturday, Saturday, Saturday the Saturday. 5th of March. <laughs> <laughs> we're, the, we're the relics, Stephen, the way we're behaving tonight. Uh, <laughs> Probably need dusting. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, any other questions or Yeah, comments? there's one more. Yeah, there's yeah. one more coming. Um, uh, who's this from? Uh, Neil Sutherland, um, excellent talk, thanks. Um, was the lack of artillery perhaps felt to be a result of a perception that many ships were available to provide naval gunfire support? I think so, and I think the, the probably the most successful attack was that one along uh, Gully Spur. Uh, do correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, um, which was supported by a naval artillery fire. But naval artillery fire, the the impact of it had been grossly overestimated. Many of these ships were older ships uh, with. Um, uh, uh, not proper range fighters or things like that. And of course, um, firing, uh, firing a naval gun onto, uh, onto land, onto a land target isn't quite as easy as it sounds. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the thing that helped with, um, uh, with Gully Spur was it was, um, it was quite high up. Um, so they could almost fire over open sites there. Um, but that's, um, but yes, um, there was always, um, they thought the ships were there just as the ships could bombard the Turkish forts and the Turks would just run away. Um, they could use ships and they, um, ship, um, naval artillery rather, and the Turks again would just run away, but it never happened like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's some very good papers on there and books on how ineffective most yeah. of the time sort of naval gunnery fire is because of the flat trajectory of the ship's mm. guns which are yeah. again designed for firing at sort so, sort of you know sh ship on ship action at 10 15 20 miles away not yeah. uh, um you know a few yards away um so just for just conscious of time in um and yep. everyone to sleep um no one from warren here is surely the ships were short of shell too at yes. one point they were I'm only allowed to fire a certain amount, so a bit of rationing, because I know there's rationing of shells for the field artillery on on land, 
have you come across that for ships? I haven't. No, the only shortage of shell was the one who was um, was the who ended up commanding the Zeebrugge raid and was very very critical of Chamberlain in Parliament. <coughs> oh, MP. Uh, Keys. Keys. Yes, he said the Turks were running out of ammunition and uh, and the uh, Dardanelles, and if they'd have only just pushed on, they would have been able to sail through the Dardanelles because the Turks were down to their last. Uh, few shells, but that's been disproved by the um, by the writer of the uh, the about the Ottoman Turks and a very good book yeah. uh, of the, the the Ottoman army in the in the Dardanelles. That's been disproved rather. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, I, th yeah. I think it's it, like, ladies and gentlemen. Unless there's any yeah. other last questions from anybody. Uh, I was wondering if I have a speak a bit um ian yeah, sure. oh, thanks yeah. thanks so it's norman Dowie here so thanks yep. for including all the uh information about my relatives you, you were asking about the scottish horse yeah um there is a booklet that you can get from them killed um they have the archives next to the cathedral but it it's not very extensive on the first world war because it covers yeah. 1900 to 1956 so there's only yeah about four or five pages yes. on uh, world war one but that's the only thing i'm aware of that uh, yes. covers the scottish horse in any detail whatsoever yeah has anybody looked at the uh, uh, the war diaries because i i just i could hardly find any mention of the scottish horse Stephen mentions them in his book um, as um, when they were victims of an australian uh, austrian not australian an austrian uh, how it's a battery uh, but there's hardly any mention of what actually occurred the fighting because it's in this time after the the august offensive um, uh, and um, in september i think they got to gallipoli they still suffered a lot of casualties from um, from small actions from snipers from uh, shelling and from disease and so on so it wasn't no, uh, it wasn't a period of all to all quiet on the Gallipoli front but I really struggled to find much about uh, what went on with the Scottish horse really. yeah the same here and there's um, the, um, there are war dogs I think they had two or three regiments out there yeah um you find a lot about sniping they're very good yes. um scouts and sort of snipers doing reconnaissances but you're right by the time around September they'd come out as all the big battles um had sort of been fought to a conclusion so very much uh, um the daily hate um as yeah. they used to call it um, yeah. and casualties through shells snipers and and of course sickness yeah as well yeah there, right. there, did, there did used to be a museum in the um in Dunkeld in the old um, drill hall which is still there so if you go and visit the town square in Dunkeld you'll see the drill hall which still has the scottish horse um, ah. badge on it um that's that's in dunkelt in, in dunkelt oh, just yeah just off the a9 as you head if you're heading north so. um, is is that one near a distillery as well <laughs> pardon <laughs> um is 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 that one near a distillery as well um I think your yeah, next one might be Pitlockery. You'll get a Pitlockery. Yeah, you're right, Alan. It's Pitlockery. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, sorry, Margaret, were you going to say something? I was going to say, I think a, a lot of the Scottish horse, when you're trying to read and find things, were moved into other battalions yeah. and, and moved and sort of joined other groups. Yeah. Oh, they were still called that. So you yeah. kind of lose it. But Dunkeld is a good place. Yeah. They've got lots. And that's where the photograph of the memorial is from, is from yes. Dunkeld. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It's incredible. Yeah, Sorry, John. I, I found that, you know, they, they recruited locally as mm -hmm. well because they were an attractive uh, yes. regiment to, to recruit because the, the the uniform and the horse, etc. But they were pretty soon put into other yeah. other regiments. Hmm. Yeah. The, the Most changes, of them ended up in the Black Watch, right? Yeah. The changes, if because uh, I, I do this talk about the Balaclava of the Dardanelles, that's the second mounted division. It was slaughtered. Many of them died crossing the, the salt flats in, in the open. Um, but the comp 
complexities of how these how these yeomanry regiments were formed reformed and then what happened after them is mind-numbing really uh, very very difficult to keep track of them all and uh, and so I think it's a feature there. I must say it's been uh, this has been a great experience for me. I really enjoyed doing this talk. And um, the whole idea was to engage with Scottish members um, because uh, we feel as trustees uh, we haven't um, engaged with Scottish members as much as we'd like over the last few years since 2015, and with the museum community, the the Scottish museum community, and the regimental associations as well. Uh, so it's been a very enjoyable experience and great to see so many um, of those north of the border um, and just to prove my um, uh, my Scottish roots I've got a ticket for Australia versus Scotland on October the 21st in uh, the Rugby League World Cup now given that Australia has won it eight times out of nine it, a score of under 80 would be a, a real victory for scotland but i'll be there supporting the jocks so. hey. <laughs> and i think on that note and um maybe pending news in the future ian on our regional conference up in scotland yes, is probably definitely. long overdue yep definitely. and we can take yep. in a few distilleries and maybe make a weekend absolutely of it, so. yes <laughs> <laughs> so well thank you very much ian for the talk tonight that was thoroughly good and i hope all those listening enjoyed it as well yep. um as with all of these talks we, we bring them free to our members and the public as well um, so if you would like to give a donation, that'd be fantastic. Um, if you're not a member, you know, please join the Glippy Association. We have a huge archive online. Um, everything you want to know about Gallipoli and probably more. Um, and if your interest is mainly the Scottish contribution to Gallipoli or the war, there's a lot of history there as well um, that you can find online. Or you know, feel free to email us um, and Ian and I will be happy to yeah, reply. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you, Ian. If you'd like to all put your hands together, I think for Ian, who's done a sterling job tonight. Thank you. And uh, hopefully thank see you, you all again Thank you very much. My pleasure. Soon. My pleasure. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. And, and good night.